century. And uh, pages 24 and 25 represent the final two pages of this lesson. I told you this lesson wasn't going to be as long as lesson 7 was uh, due to the fact that uh, the error that we have been discussing, we've discussed before. I'm going to try not to do so much repetition because we have error, just keep introduced, it's confirmed, and, and so we, we, we're going to be traveling quite quickly. And uh, we're, uh, the lesson nine will be dealing with a thousand years of, of history until we get to the Reformation, which is where we wind up with a whole bunch of churches. We've been talking about the Council of Nicaea because it is there that we have the first ecumenical council. Ecumenical means that all churches uh, were uh, invited to come. Now, certainly not all churches sent bishops. There were still some churches that were faithful to God. We, we should not generalize and say that the entire church of Christ went off into error. It didn't, because they were autonomous. But what made this council so significant is that it brought together a lot under one roof. Error was taught, or at least the, the fact that the council was there itself shows a breakdown in congregational autonomy. And the uh, power structure was really cemented in the empire, the Roman Empire, and it would be refocused in the Bishop of Rome. And so uh, this is where a lot of the error that we've been dealing with up until this point really gets cemented down into the power structure and future uh, future error being taught instead of being maybe a province or a territory that goes off into error it will be the formation of the Catholic Church where we get this hierarchy and rules are made and it's expected that churches will follow and so we got to the actual Nicene Creed which was stated the beliefs of the council. And um, I'm going to get Tammy. We're on, we're on uh, page 23 under 0.6-1. Could you read what the creed is that I have there? Do you have that in yeah. front of you? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, both visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten by the Father, begotten, that is to say, of the substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both things in heaven and things on earth, who for us men and our salvation came down and was made flesh, made man, suffered and rose again on the third day and went into the heavens and is to come again to judge both the quick and the dead, and in the Holy Ghost. That's a pretty long statement. It's one uh, it, it, it's, yeah, and that, it really is one sentence. And the dash, I copied it exactly as I found it in the book that uh, I was using. And it's, it, but it's, it's, it's a statement of faith. And sometimes when you go on websites for churches, you go to a page, and we have a page on our website. This is about, and it's what we believe. That's not a creed. What I've made sure it's not, and Dave made sure that too when the website was created, it's not a creed of what we believe. It's based on scriptural verses. Now, there is no verses here that talk about anything. It's not wrong to state what the scriptures say. This is what we believe. This is what the Bible says. And we use the Bible to teach that. Now you might say, well, there was no Bible there. Yes, there was. Uh, by this point, at 325 AD, the scriptures existed. We can't come along and say, well, the churches didn't have the, the revealed word. They did. They had the book of Ephesians. They had the book of Colossians. They had 
uh, the book of Hebrews and the book of John and the book of 1 Corinthians and the book of Acts. They had all of these things. They could have simply said, this, we're going to agree with what Luke said in Acts and what Paul said in Ephesians and what uh, the Hebrew writer said in the book of Hebrews and so on and so on. But no, they came up with a creed. This was a determination of the council. As if the council needed to determine who Jesus was. The, this idea, okay, we don't know everything about God, and that's true. And we try to boil it down to something that people can relate to. And I understand that people think the Bible is too difficult to understand. It's really not when we sit down and read it. But people have been told it's too hard to understand, and therefore it's too hard to understand. Uh, it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy. When, when people say something's hard, people think it's hard and they can't do it. You tell someone something's easy, and they go in with that frame of mind, and lo and behold, it might be something that is hard, but since they were told it was easy, they think they can do it. And so that's really what this creed is. It was decided by the council. Well, what does the Bible say? God, the nature of God, is not fully revealed to us. But we shouldn't say things the Bible doesn't say. But we should say what the Bible does. So let's go to our Bibles. We'll go to Bill, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. Uh, <clears throat> there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. So, what can we learn about God from what Bill read? What can we learn? There's only one God and Father? There's only one God and Father. What else? People want to speak about the body and the spirit? Well, I'm it's looking for one spirit, okay? That's the Holy Spirit. Right. And what else? One Lord. One Lord. And there are four other things that there are only one of as well, but we're leaving aside that. We're just talking about God. There is one Holy Spirit, one Lord, and one God and Father. So we do know the the the, the whole point of the Nicene Council was to talk about the deity of Jesus. Well, we know that Jesus exists. We know the Holy Spirit exists, and we know that God the Father exists. We don't have to wonder if they are all God. Paul says he is. But let's go and get some other verses. We, we know that at least there's only one. There aren't two. There aren't two fathers. The Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father because they're all three listed in Ephesians 4. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to read the first 14 verses. Well, I guess it's, uh, yeah, the first 14 verses, which is the entire chapter. Let's read three verses each. We'll start with Henry, and I'll join in the reading on this as well. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. God's final word in his uh, God, after he spoke a long time to great fathers, in the prophets, in many portions, and in many ways. In this last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he is appointing heir of our sins, through whom also he made the world. One more verse. And uh, he is the uh, radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds our sins by the word of his power, when he had made uh, pure purification of sins is set down at the right hand of the majesty of God. There is the council much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and again, I will be to him the father. And he shall be to be a son. But when he again brings the first born into the world, he says, 
and all the angels of God worship him. But the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like garments. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like garments, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. But to which the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? All right. So... What do we learn about Jesus here? Because that's the Council of Nicaea. We're not denying, we're not talking about God the Father. Ephesians 4 told us that Jesus is not the Father. What does Hebrews 1 tell us about Jesus? There's many things. There's no right answer. Many things. One of them said this in the creed, but our passage said he's got the Father has spoken to us through his Son. All right, he speaks to us through his Son. I don't think the creed mm -hmm. talks about that. It does talk about some other things that yeah. that that is in Hebrews one, but I, I would agree with you. That's where I was going first. He speaks through his son, so he speaks through his son today. What else? Verse three has a lot in it. Uh, we're not going to be able to talk about it all, but what do we get a sense of from verse three? Exact representation. Yeah. What does that make Jesus? Equal. Equal. The same. And God Himself. When we have when we have written here, that is to say, the same substance of the Father, God of God, light of life, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. That's what he that's what Hebrews 1 is trying to tell us. Jesus is God. He is the same as God. We are not the same as God. How do we differ? We're made in the image of God, but how do we differ from God? Many things. Oh, we're sinful. Oh, we're sin. Well, yeah, but we weren't made oh, that way. No. Uh, no, we're made we're, in His image. We're made in His image. We're physical and not spiritual. We're not eternal. We have never existed. We're not all-powerful, all-knowing. We are less than God. Jesus, though, is not. He is the express image, the express image of his person. He upholds all things by the word of his power when he had himself, this is Jesus, but he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus is all powerful here. That's only God can say that. Uh, only God can say that. He himself purged our sins. Well, the Nicene Creed comes down, made to suffer and rise again. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, he said, he, the Nicene Creed talks about being begotten. Now, verse 5 says, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That's a quote from Psalms. And it's talking, when, when, when the Nicene Creed says, begotten, not made, they misunderstand what begotten means. Begotten does mean born. But in what way was Jesus begotten? What was he born of? I think this was in Sunday's sermon. What was he begotten? How was Jesus begotten? Raised from the dead. Raised from the dead. That's what Paul in Acts 13 makes clear when he is speaking to the people in Antioch of Pisidia. Paul makes clear what begotten means in the book of Psalms. It's not Jesus was made like an angel or like a human or like this universe. It's that he was the first begotten of the dead. He was born from the dead, as far as raised from the dead. And that's how Jesus is begotten. Uh, 
And so he is the he is begotten, not made. Well, no, the scriptures never claim he was made, unless you want to misunderstand what begotten means. And the entire chapter, we find that Jesus was the creator of this universe. We find that in other places as well. But when we read of in the beginning God said, let there be light, and there was light, we don't often think of Jesus in that passage. We see the Spirit specifically in that passage. And the, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We see the Holy Spirit identified in Genesis chapter 1. But we don't often think of Jesus in Genesis chapter 1. Yeah, we come down in verse 26, let us make men in our image, and we, we say, well, obviously there was somebody else there, and, but Jesus isn't mentioned by name. The Son is not mentioned by name. When we read of God, we, we, we automatically go to the Father. And that's not wrong. When God said, let there be light, that's God the Father, and there was light, that's Jesus. Jesus is the one who created light, created the, the, separated the light from the darkness, created this earth, created everything that's in it. Hebrews chapter 1 says so. He, through whom he also made the worlds, verse 2. So, Jesus is gone. Uh, I don't know how the Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, do have a lot of trouble with Hebrews chapter 1 because it's quoted from Psalms where the word, uh, the word Jehovah is used in their in their uh, translation of the Bible, and it's quoted all the way throughout here, and and they have a problem with Hebrews chapter one. But verse two says, "Through whom he also made the worlds." Genesis one says it was God who created the worlds, and so if Genesis one is correct and Hebrews one is correct, Jesus made the worlds. Jesus is God. We don't have to wonder about that. Hebrews one says so. Now let's go to the book of John. Let's go to John chapter 1. We're going to start with Bill. We'll do our three verses each, but this time we're going to stop at verse 14. We're going to do 14 verses, but that's not the entire chapter this time. Three each? Three each. <clears throat> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. And in him was life, and the life was the light of man. The night shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And there came a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the life. For all through him I believe. It was not that night, I was sent to bear witness of that night. There was the true light which gave light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, your verse got rid of that word begotten, which would have been nice in that. But, uh, in verse 14. Alright. The Nicene Creed had a phrase that's in that fourth line that's also found in John 1. What do we find about Jesus here? We've already discussed that he's God. We already discussed that he's the creator of this universe. What do we find? That he's light. He is light. Now, verse John 1, verse 5 says, God is light, and then is no darkness. But Jesus here is light. Uh, he, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. Well, Nicene Creed has light of light here. Uh, light of light. Well, John 1 says he's light. John 1 says he's light. And uh, John the Baptist, who verse 6 says, he's not the light, but he came to bear witness of the light, that true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. How is Jesus the light? 
is the one who shines in the darkness. He brings salvation to men that all who believe in him will not perish. That's John 1. Now let's go to John 17. John 17. Uh, Tammy's going to get, well, we'll do two verses here. One, we'll start with Tammy, verses 1 to 5, in John 17. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. This is the eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which you had with you before the world was. All right. What I'm looking for here is towards the end of the creed. Jesus, of course, is preaching, or is preaching, he's praying to God the Father. This is the night in which he's going to be arrested. This is right before he's going to be arrested. What do we find from John 17, 1 to 5, that we find near the end? Maybe the second, uh, you know, the second full last line. Sort of goes into both lines. Where did he go? Part where he judges? No, 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 that'll be later. Where did he go after he was raised? Well, oh, went, in, went into the heavens. Went into the heavens. Yeah. Jesus was asking, glorify your son. And he wanted to, to go back to heaven. He wanted that glory which was given, which he had before this world was. Now, we know from Acts chapter 1, he ascended to heaven. And so we have that at the end. But other than that, we still get Jesus having authority. He brought salvation. And, oh, I forgot to say from John 1, the world it was made flesh. From John chapter 1, he became and made it was made flesh, as the creed says. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's get the first eight verses. We'll start with Henry, who didn't get both... Uh, you didn't get the opportunity to read two verses, so we'll do two verses each. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Now I am made known to you, brethren, the God for which I preach to you, which also you receive, in which also you, you stand, of which also you are saved. If you hold the fast the word which I have preached to you, unless you believe in your way. For I believe that you first of all, of which I also received, that Christ died for all the sins according, the, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Stephen, then by the twelve, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. All right. So here we get the part of the creed that talks about him uh, rise, suffering, rising again, third day. And so we get that from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And finally... The last part uh, is talking about, um, it is found from Acts 17. This is found from Paul's message uh, to the Athenians. And we'll start with Tammy, we'll do two verses each, 22 through 31. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands 
as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he make from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. And he determined the appointed times and the boundaries of the ground habitation. And that they would seek God. Perhaps they might grow before him and find him. So he is not far from each one of us. For in him, we live and grow and have all and have all of being. As also some of you will come first as say, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something sharp by our commandments diversity. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to this of this to all by raising him from the dead. A lot of what we read of in this Nicene Creed is found here in Acts chapter 17. Uh, and it's reworded a little bit, but this is where we get the idea that Jesus is going to judge this world. This council was convened to determine who Jesus was. However, from the scriptures that we just read, it should have been undeniable to the church who Jesus was. Everything they say here about Jesus Christ is somewhere found in scriptures. Therefore, they don't need the creed. All we do when someone comes here and wants to teach something, the one, what do we ask? If, 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 there, if someone gets up here and preaches something, it could be on anything, and we're confused about it, what do we ask? Where does it say that in the Bible? Where does it say that in the Bible? Someone comes and teaches something. We're either confused about it, never heard about it before, and the preacher gets up and just says something but doesn't go to the Bible to, to justify it, you're going to ask him, where does it say that in the Bible? That's not what this council did. This council decided who Jesus was. They didn't decide anything. Jesus was going to be God if this, even if the council had determined he wasn't. Arius and his friends thought that Jesus was not God. He was not equal to the Father, despite the fact that Philippians says he is. We didn't read that one, talking about Jesus being equal with God. Uh, he is equal with God. He is God. We can learn everything we wanted to know about the relationship of God the Father and Jesus Christ without a creed. Whatever is not revealed to us in Scripture, we don't need to know and shouldn't speculate on. We don't need a creed. We want to learn about Jesus, ask the preacher, or create a lesson yourself. Learn about Jesus. Go to the scriptures. There's a lot of material on Jesus. Are you going to understand everything there is to know about Jesus? No. This is not all, because everything about Jesus is not contained in the scriptures. But what is contained in the scriptures, you can know. And whatever is not contained in the scriptures, you don't need to know. And so, we don't need this creed. People say, well, there, what's, what, what is there wrong in this creed? Well, even though it's one sentence and might contain some truth in it, the fact of the matter is it was obtained in the wrong way. It wasn't like what they did in Acts chapter 15, where they gathered together, and what did they do? They appealed to example. They appealed to scripture. They didn't come out with a creed from Acts 15. They determined what the truth was from Acts 15. This council, from what I read, didn't go to Scripture and they came out with a creed saying this is what we believe and this is what everyone must believe. Something that was written 
by men. No, I'm choosing to believe what's written by God. Even if what's written by men is truth, I still need to follow what's written by God. What's written by men is not worth the piece of paper it's written on. The Holy Scripture is what reveals to us the truth. So that's the, ne that's the Nicene Creed. Any questions, comments uh, up to this point? So, Bill? It's just a sneaky way to, <laughs> to get you to put your trust in them. Yes. And make you lazy also. They don't mm -hmm. want you really reading your Bible. They'll no. tell you. <laughs> no. Oh, I, well, that, that's true. I hadn't thought of it that way, but that is true. Get you to put their, your trust in the bishops, the elders, to tell you what truth is instead of you going to the scriptures and reading them for yourselves. This is what we believe. This is what it means to be a Christian. Find it in the Bible. Find it in the Bible and use that. Council of Nicaea, though, came out with more than just a creed. It also fixed the date of Easter. It's amazing that they had to fix the date of Easter because it's not found in the scriptures, so obviously there was contention. When do we celebrate Easter? Well, by that time, in the East, it was observed on the 14th day of Nisan, which is the Jewish Passover. Many churches, though, observed it on the Sunday after that day. So in other words, some observed it on the day of the Passover. Some observed it on the Sunday after that day. The council, though, wanted uniformity. Didn't want disagreement. Constantine hated disagreement. He wanted uniformity. He wanted control. And that's what this creed was. He didn't want Arius teaching false doctrine, and Arius was teaching false doctrine, but instead of saying, no, 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 we're going to stick to the Bible and what the scriptures say, he came up with his own creed that people had to follow. Well, Easter was then, was determined, it was going to be observed as the first Sunday after the first full moon, which appears next after March 21st, which is the spring equinox. That's why Sometimes Easter is in March. That's why some, most of the time, Easter is in April. Because if, if the full moon in March occurs after the equinox, that first Sunday will be Easter. And I think this year it was April 1st. I don't know what, I forget what the earliest date is. It's, uh, it's pretty, I guess technically, if... Uh, the full moon was on the equinox, which is the 21st, and that and that equinox fell on the Saturday. I guess the first date could be uh, April the uh, or March the 22nd. I guess that's what it could be uh, if that's the date. Uh, I could be wrong on that, and so if I am wrong, I apologize. And 28 days later would be the la the latest date that. Uh, the equinox can fall on, or the Easter can fall on, because that's how long as it takes for the moon, uh, the full moon to, or the moon to go around the earth. So it'll appear sometime in those 28 days, and sometimes Easter can be rather late, uh, 15th or 16th of April. And so, uh, but they, the fact that they had to set a date shows that the apostles didn't observe Easter. The early church didn't observe Easter. A scripture would have set that date. Passover was set. You are going to observe it on this day of the month of Nisan, 14th day of Nisan. If God wanted the date set, he would have set the date. He set the date of Passover. He set the date of Pentecost. He set the date of all the feasts that were in the Old Testament. God knows how to read a calendar. He can tell us if he wants it to be observed. He doesn't. But this council took legislative power, power it didn't have, wasn't given to determine something that didn't need to be observed. Now the point of this council, as Constantine saw it, was to gain peace among the church and thus the empire. Remember, church and state are now intertwined and woven together. If there's peace among the church, there would be peace among the empire. This peace, however, was not permanent, for Constantine later accepted Arianism, turning against Athena uh, Athanasius, who was banished from his diocese. So in other words, Constantine, in the end, Constantine uh, turned against his own council. 
He later accepted Arianism, the very thing that this council went and uh, went uh, and taught against. That shows you the power of the emperor. He believed what he was going to believe. It didn't matter if this council determined otherwise, he was going to believe what he was going to believe. The Nicene Creed failed to unite all believers, for at a later date the Council of Constantinople was convened to change the creed to conform to the beliefs of that day. We'll get to that a little later on in our study of this uh, going towards the 5th century. But there's a thing with councils. What one council says is okay, another council can come and undo. It's like what happens with government. We are seeing this in Ontario. We have elected a new government. And the government's been in power for three months. What are they been trying to do without getting into politics? In general, what are they trying to do? Change what the previous government did. Change what the previous government did. And that's what happens whenever you change governments. It doesn't matter what, what party to what party. They're going to get in, and they're going to try and undo or change everything that the previous government did. Well, when you come along and accept that councils are acceptable in trying to find doctrine, what one council determined, if another generation comes along and says, no, 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 I don't believe that, they're going to convene another council and going to change the creed. The Nicene Creed did not, did not create the peace that Constantine wanted, and so other councils came along and changed it later. And so a point on creeds before we close this evening God gave to no man, nor to any set of men, the right to form a creed, to legislate concerning things divine, or to intrude into those things which are not revealed. Some believe that a creed is only a comprehensive statement to make clear the teachings of God's word. However, if man has the ability to clarify the teachings of God, that he would be wiser than God. What arrogance man has. The Bible was written to be understood. Who's next? I'll read his name. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. When you can understand my knowledge. That's why Paul wrote the letter of Ephesians. That's why Paul wrote the epistles he did, the 13 epistles he did. That's why the New Testament writers wrote. They wrote to be understood. We think, well, we have to have our own creeds so that people will know what we believe. We believe what's in this book. You want, you want to know what we believe? We believe everything from Genesis to Revelation. Beginning of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, to Revelation chapter 22. First verse to the last verse. We believe in all. Yes, we're under the New Testament today and the New Covenant, but that doesn't mean we don't believe that the Old Covenant existed. That doesn't mean that the Old Covenant has no value to us because we can look at it to see how people were expected to obey under the Old Covenant, how God treated people under the Old Covenant, and we can learn how God expects, the type of obedience God expects under the New Covenant. We don't follow the things written in the book of Leviticus, but that doesn't mean they have no value. That doesn't mean we should not study them. We should, because sometimes, and a lot of the time, they will illuminate some of the teachings in the New Testament, some of those shadows that, and, and those, those types and antitypes that we sometimes study are enlightened by what's in the Old Testament. And so we believe what the Bible says. We have no creeds, we don't need any creeds because that would make us wiser than God. That would say that the Bible is not understandable when it is. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord.